let us begin. Part two, chapter three, of At Home in Mickford. In our last session, we were sort of introduced to the characters and um, a painting was given by Miss Sadie to Lord's Chapel, which is the church that Father Tim is the priest at, which may or may not be a Vermeer. The appraiser is taking it away and sending it off to appraisers in New York or somewhere like that. Somewhere. Mm. Somewhere where presumably lots of knowledgeable appraisers are. And uh, Father Tim is feeling ineffective in his chapel. Chapter three, new possibilities. <clears throat> Much to his relief, little mention of the painting came to his ears during Holy Week. Palm Sunday had been a blessing to the congregation, and on Maundy Thursday, he had truly experienced a deep and enriching mournfulness. On Good Friday, he fasted, and on Holy Saturday, felt much the better for it in every way. Easter morning dawned bright and clear. Dazzling to the senses, said one parishioner. The beautiful old church was full for both services, and the tremor of joy that one always hoped for on this high day was decidedly there. Perhaps one of the highest points for him had been looking out into the 11 o'clock congregation and seeing Miss Sadie sitting with Luella and her grandson. The countenances of all three were radiant, which created a special pool of light on the gospel side. After church, Luella grabbed him and gave him a bosomy hug. That's some ham you baked, she said. We got into it last night with the jello, and Miss Sadie's going to run it by us again today. Hal and Marge were there, their good news shining in their eyes. Emma wore a hat with a bird of paradise on one side, and was proudly showing off her da daughter from Atlanta, and Miss Rose and Uncle Billy usually partial to the Presbyterians, attended their first service at Lord's Chapel. He saw faces he'd never seen before and would never see again, and faces that had become as familiar as his own. It had been a good 12 years in Mitford. During the days following Easter Sunday, he noticed a certain lassitude of spirit in himself. He would go to his back door and gaze at the azaleas, which he'd left sitting along the bank in their potting cans. There was still a flat of pansies to be planted and a dozen rare pink day ladies. Day lilies, not day ladies. I don't know what those would be. But the joy he'd felt in gardening only days before seemed to have vanished. A letdown was to be expected after the intense activities of high holy days. He went to the library at noon and sat idly reading, wanting a nap, forgetting to have lunch. At last, he forced himself to check out the latest Dick Francis, a book on dog breeds, a volume of Voltaire, and Maeterlinck's Intelligence of the Flowers. He felt so exhausted from selecting the books that he did something entirely out of the ordinary. He phoned Emma to say he was going home. I'm calling Hoppy this minute, she said, alarmed. There's nothing to worry about in the least. I'm just a little tired, that's all. I expect to be there bright and early in the morning. Well, it's my day off, you know, but I'll come in at ten to check on you. I found us a new kind of little Debbies, and I'll bring you a box. He couldn't summon the energy to argue with her. He also noted vaguely that her offer of one of his favorite sweets had no appeal. By the time he reached the new men's store a block away, he regretted having checked out the books he was carrying, especially the Voltaire, which suddenly felt like the complete works. Miss Rose and Uncle Billy lived on Mitford's main street, in one room of a house that was variously called a disgrace, an eyesore, and a crying shame. The house had been built in the late 1920s by Miss Rose's brother, Willard, Willard Porter, who invented and sold pharmaceuticals. His biggest seller, a chest rub, had added the second story, the wooden shutters with cutouts of a dove, a wraparound porch, and a widow's walk. There was an ornate gazebo, large enough for dances, that had commemorated the success of a flavored lip balm and four sculptured stone garden benches with carved angels' heads, sitting in what once was a majestic rose garden, had marked the debut of a cough syrup containing mountain herbs. The house had historically been the pride of the village, sitting as it did on the edge of the old town green, across from the war monument, and displaying the finest architecture of its time. In recent years, however, all that had changed. The stone benches with carved angels' heads were crumbling to dust, Many of the shutters lay in the grass where they had fallen, and Uncle Billy had nailed a no-trespassing sign on the widow's walk. 
A decorator from Raleigh had tried often to buy the Porter Place for a second home, thinking how spectacular it would be for parties. When all efforts to buy it through Mule Skinner had failed, she took it upon herself personally to visit Miss Rome and Uncle Billy, who were sitting in the backyard in two chrome dinette chairs at a wooden spool previously used to roll up electrical wiring. They were eating bologna sandwiches and drinking iced tea from jelly glasses. Miss Rose wiped her mouth on a threadbare T-shirt that said, I surfed Laguna Beach. I'm Susan Parnell Phipps, the, the intruder informed them, with more eagerness than was necessary. This is Rose, said Uncle Billy, and I'm the thorn. At that, Uncle Billy grinned broadly, showing all three of his teeth, one of which was covered with enough gold to re-roof the house, as a neighbor once said. Miss Rose glowered at the visitor. I'm not selling. Selling? But how did you, I mean, what makes you think I'm buying? I can always tell. Miss Rose snapped. Recently, the new men's store had tried to buy the place, and so had a dozen others over the years, but Miss Rose stood her ground. Home is where the heart is, she said to one prospective buyer who knocked on their door in January, and found her in a chenille robe, a World War II trench coat, a pair of rubber garden boots, a man's felt hat, and what appeared to be Uncle Billy's flannel pajama bottoms. As far as the frozen collar could tell, there was no heat in the house, being a caring soul, he inquired around and was told that the Presbyterian Church had filled up Mrs. Rose, Miss Rose's oil tank in November, and on last inspection it was still full. Most people knew, too, that the old couple walked to Winnie Ivy's bake shop every afternoon, always hand in hand, to pick up what was left over. Winnie, however, was not one to give away the store. She carefully portioned out what she thought they would eat that night and the next morning, and no more. She did not like the idea of Miss Rose feeding her perfectly good day-old Danish to the birds. After their visit to the bake shop, Miss Rose and Uncle Billy, walking very slowly due to arthritis and a half dozen other ailments, dropped by to see what Velma had left at the Main Street Grill. Usually it was a few slices of bacon and liver mush from breakfast, or a container of soup and a couple of hamburger rolls from lunch. Occasionally she might add a little chicken salad that Percy had made himself that very morning. On balance, it was said, Miss Rose and Uncle Billy fared pretty well in Mitford, and many were pleased to see that they provided for their spiritual nourishment as well by going to church on Sunday. Recently, that very thing had been a matter for conversation around the village since they'd been over to the Chapel of Our Lord and Saviour, as it was properly called, four Sundays in a row, including Easter. Are you going to visit Miss Rose and Uncle Billy? Emma asked one morning as Father Tim came in with Barnabas. He hung his hat on a peg. Do I need to? Hmm. Well, you do usually go to visit after somebody's been to church a few times. Yes, I'll do that. Soon. Remind me to do that. Don't eat anything while you're there, she warned. They say Miss Rose cooks sometimes. He was going through the mail that Harold Newman, the postman, had just handed him, since the mailbox was too small to hold this morning the bundle. He spied a letter from Walter. Are you pale today? Emma demanded. Pale? Do I look pale? As a ghost. He slowly opened the letter, stared at what appeared to be a blur, then sat down heavily on the corner of his desk. Something, he said vaguely. Something is not right. Emma rose to steady him. Don't move, she said, afraid he might crash to the floor. I'm bringing the car to the door and we're going to the hospital. This said Dr. Walter Harper, who was known to the village's hoppy, is where the robber hits the road. Meaning? Meaning the party's over, pal. You've got to make some changes big time. He sighed. Change. If there was anything he didn't like, that was it, right there in a nutshell. Emma, who had left her glasses at the office, was squinting at cartoons in an old New Yorker when Hoppy and Father Tim came out of the waiting room. Hoppy Harper was tall, slim, and even handsome with his piercing green eyes, intense gaze and determined jaw. Only last September, his wife of 16 years had died of cancer, and the grief had aged him noticeably. Those who cared about him enough to look closely, and there were quite a few, saw that grief had done also something else. It had deepened him. Emma, he said, let's have a talk. Oh, God, Emma thought, using the proper meaning of the phrase, let everything be all right. I've already been over this with Tim, but I think somebody close to him should also know the score. This is a dark day, Emma, said the rector, managing a weak smile. Diabetes, Hoppy said. That's the bad news. 
The good news is it's non-insulin dependent, which means he won't require regular insulin shots. What he will require is a change of diet. Little Debbie's, pies, cakes, candies, out of here. We stuck his finger for blood sugar and it's over 350, not good. And he's got four plus sugar in the urine. So here's the scoop. There was something in the doctor's green eyes that made Emma concentrate on every word. Exercise. Jogging is what I recommend. Three times a week and no less. Morning, night, noon, wherever, whenever. But he's got to do it. The rector looked anguished. Less fat in his diet, juice, a lot of fresh fruit. And no skipping meals. Hoppy grinned and looked at his patient. Now, the most important thing of all, and that's changing your schedule. You haven't had a real vacation in 12 years, and you usually work seven days a week. I can't tell you how to change that, but it's got to change. Think about it, pal. Hoppy ran his fingers through his unruly hair. Emma thought he looked tired and wondered who was taking care of him. He had a hurried lunch of Percy's soup of the day with a salad and went home to say a word to Barnabas. This took him past the new men's store which he had failed to stop and inspect since it opened with some fanfare before Easter. The collar button, it was called. It had been a long time indeed since he'd gone into a clothing store. In the first place, he didn't like to shop. In the second place, the price for clothes these days was absolutely, yes, he thought he could honestly say it, sinful. And in the third place, what was the going fashion for a rector who didn't wish to appear conspicuously well-dressed? He slipped his hand into his jacket pocket and felt his mended gloves which he still needed from time to time on cold mornings. He must not get carried away in this place, he thought. He would say he was just looking. The collar button was new, but it seemed old. The walls were dark, burnished panels of mahogany. A low fire burned in a grate, and a large golden retriever lying by the hearth opened one eye as he came in. Good heavens, he said, with earnest appreciation. This was like walking into a study in some far reach of Cambridge where he had once gone to research a paper on the life and works of C.S. Lewis. Father Tim, I believe, boomed a deep voice, and from behind a wall of brocade curtains stepped the new proprietor, extending his hand to the rector. That's right, how did you know? Oh, I've seen you pass now and again, and I thought to myself, there goes a proper candidate for the collar button style. And uh, what style is that exactly? English gentleman, country squire, village rector, the man of thoughtful reflection and quiet taste. Aha. Uh -huh. What can I show you? Oh, and would you care for a dash of sherry? His head was fairly swimming with the unexpected dazzle of the modern shopping experience. When he left the collar button, he was carrying a large bag with two jogging suits and a box with a new spring sport coat. For the life of him, he couldn't figure out how it had all come about. He had mentioned jogging, and then before he knew it was happening, he was standing before a mirror in a turquoise jogging outfit, trying to hold his stomach in. He had to admit he would need something to run in. He certainly could not do it in a jacket, trousers, and a shirt with a clerical collar. As he hurried toward home, clutching his packages, he muttered all the excuses he could possibly think of for having spent such a large sum of money on himself. On Saturday morning, he put on the forest green running suit and a pair of old Nikes that he'd worn for several years in the garden. Running shoes was a category he dreaded investigating. Someone had recently told him that shoes these days had parts that you literally pumped up. It was an esoteric realm, and so for now, he concluded, it would have to be his old garden shoes or nothing. He was smitten at once with the comfort of the new outfit he was wearing. In fact, he praised it aloud. Why, this feels just like pajamas, he said into the full-length mirror behind the guest room door. Barnabas barked and leapt backward when he saw the rector coming into the hall. You'll have to get used to it, old fellow. If I do what the doctor ordered, I'll be looking like this three times a week, so pipe down. Barnabas, however, could not contain his excitement over something new in the air. He leapt up and put his forepaws on his master's chest and cocked his head to one side. Jesus said to the disciples, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The rector looked Barnabas squarely in the eye. Barnabas sighed heavily and lay down at his master's feet. And don't let it happen again, he said, brushing off his new jogging suit. He knew he didn't want to be seen doing this. First, he wanted to try it out in a place where there was no traffic. And while he'd seen countless others running heedlessly along Main Street, he felt somehow that jogging was an intimate activity, accompanied by snorts, sweating, hawking and spitting, and an inordinate amount of huffing and puffing. 
Why in the world anyone would want to do that up and down the center of town was beyond him. I kind of agree, having joined a running club. But at the same time, no one really cares about what you look like when you're running, which I'm sure he'll discover eventually. He went to the study window at the back of the rectory and peered across his greening yard into Baxter Park. As far as he could see, the coast was clear. He began in a kind of lope along the flagstones by his perennial beds, through the space into the head, <laughs> through the space in the head, and out to Baxter Park, where he turned left and ran close to the hemlock border. By the time he reached the middle of the park, he was winded. Take it easy, Poppy had told him. Don't try to do Boston the first time out. He had already broken a light sweat. A squirrel chattered by one of the ancient park benches. A chipmunk dashed across the grass, and the old fountain, now green with moss and algae, made a sweet pattering sound. A bronze plaque on the fountain read, given in loving memory of Rachel Livingston Baxter, 1889 to 1942. Miss Sadie's mother, he thought, thankful for such an oasis of peace. He wondered why he hadn't been this, in this wonderful old park in several years, even though it bordered his yard and he looked into it nearly every day. Starting again, he jogged over to Old Church Lane. Then he ran with surprising ease up the hill toward the meadow, where the remains of the ruined Lord's Chapel stood. Panting and soaked with sweat, his heart pounding furiously, he sat on a crumbling stone wall that, bowed, that bordered the old churchyard and saw what lay before him, as if for the first time. It was, he thought, the land of counterpane. The view swept down to a small valley with church spires, orderly farms and freshly planted fields. Then the walls of the far, the far walls of the valley rose steeply and rolled away ridge upon ridge, wave upon wave of densely blue, mist-cloaked mountains. He sat as if stunned for a long moment. Then he tried to recall when he'd been up here last. It had been seven or eight years, he figured, since he'd climbed the steep lane with Walter and Catherine and a picnic basket. He wondered who he might share it with now, but could think of no one except, of course, Barnabas. His heart had ceased its thundering, and a light breeze coming up from the valley seemed sweet with the fragrance of earth and manure, leaf mold, and blossoming trees. He got up from the wall, idly wondering how long he had sat there, and began his jog down Old Church Lane. He was no longer trying to hide himself along the hedges. In fact, he discovered that he was suddenly feeling absolutely top-notch, as Walter might say. As he ran, he became aware that he was thinking the oddest thoughts, thoughts of how he might look in his new spring sport coat, about the little girl's pony that had got caught in the barbed wire fence, whether Emma had dyed her hair at home or had it done by Fancy Skinner. Also, he hoped the pink day lilies would not disappoint him and bloom out orange. He turned out of the bright sun and into the cool morning shade of Baxter Park and paused again to rest at the fountain. Maybe this jogging business wouldn't be so bad after all. New possibilities lay before him, it seemed, though he couldn't yet tell what they were. Perhaps it was time to make some other changes as well, to do something fresh, something different and unexpected. The idea came upon him quite suddenly. He would give a dinner party. Chapter 4. Company Stew In the village of less than a thousand, everyone's dinner, party or otherwise, began at the local unless they wanted to make the 15-mile drive to food value. Of course, they could go out on the highway to Clore's Market, but Hattie Clore was so well known for telling customers her aches and pains that hardly anyone ever did that. See this right here, she might say, pointing to her shoulder. Last night, something come up there big as a grapefruit. I said, Clyde, put your head right here and feel that. What do you think it is? And Clyde said, why, law, that feels like some kind of a golf ball or something in there. And don't you know, Darlene took to barking, and that thing took to hurting, and I never laid my head on the pillow till way up in the morning. Wouldn't you like a pound or two of these nice snap beans? Worse than that, according to some, was Darlene, Hattie's chihuahua, who lay on a sack by the cash register. Every time Hattie rang up a sale, the dog growled and snapped at the customer. Avis Packard had once said that Hattie Clower had sent more business to the local than any advertising he'd ever run in the paper. Two weeks after his first jog up to Church Hill, Father Tim made an early Saturday call at the local. 
Since Barnabas was running with him these days, he found it convenient that the local had an old bike rack near the front door, where the dog could be tied on a short leash. He was still out of breath, and Barnabas was panting with some exhaustion himself. The route had by now fallen into place. They ran through Baxter Park and up to Church Hill, then along the quiet road by Miss Sadie's apple orchards, past the Presbyterian Church, three times around the parking lot, down Lilac Road to Main Street, and then to Wisteria Lane, where they turned toward home. Two miles, right on the money, he discovered with immense satisfaction. Morning, Father, said Avis, who was sitting at the cash register. How does jogging compare to working up a sermon? Well, Avis, I can't see there's much difference. I dread both, but once I get started, there's nothing I'd rather be doing. We got those fine-looking brown eggs, you like? And Luther Lavelle's boys delivered the nicest bunch of broilers you ever seen. You ought to look at those and check that pretty batch of calf liver while you're at it. One thing Father Tim liked about Avis Packard was the way he got excited about his groceries. He could rhapsodize about the first fresh strawberries from the valley in a way that made him a veritable Wordsworth of garden fare. We got a special today on tenderloin that's so true to the meaning of the name you can cut it with a fork. Well, now I'm not shopping, Avis. I'm looking. What are you looking for? Avis cocked his head to one side like he always did when he asked a question. Ideas. You see, I've decided to give a dinner party. You don't mean it. Oh, I do, but the thing is, I don't know what to cook. Well, sir, that's a problem, all right. I'll be thinking about it while you look around, Avis assured him. A little line was forming at the cash register, so the rector moved away, greeting shoppers as he meant. As he went, he stopped to talk to everyone, taking note that four people wondered where his collar was, and only one inquired about the painting, for which he was grateful. At the produce bins, he admitted he was feeling slightly nervous over his idea. First of all, he didn't even have a guest list. Of course he was going to ask Emma, and yes, Miss Sadie. He thought that she would make a splendid contribution. Besides, he had heard she once went to school in Paris, and he wanted to know more, to know more about it. Hal and Marge, of course, no doubt about that. Poppy Harper, now there was a thought. His wife gone and no one to look after him but that old housekeeper. That made six, including himself. Six. For the life of him, he couldn't think of another soul that would fit in just right with that particular group. Perhaps he should invite Winnie Ivy, since she was always feeding everybody else. Maybe he would do that. Avis came down the aisle with a gleam in his eye. I turned the register over to my boy. I want to help you get your party going. What do you think about beef stroganoff, a salad with bib lettuce, chicory, slices of navel orange and spring onions, and new potatoes roasted with fresh rosemary? Of course, I'd put a nice bottle of Cabernet behind that. 1982. He sat with Barnabas one evening with a lap full of cookbooks. As much as he appreciated Avis Packard's menu planning, beef stroganoff seemed too ordinary. He wanted something that spoke of spring, that made people feel there was a celebration going on, and that would fill them up without being too heavy. This is a lot of work, he confided to Barnabas, who appeared to understand, and I haven't even started yet. He wondered why he had waited so long to entertain. It was clear to him that he had gotten completely out of the notion, though once he had loved doing it. He'd had the bishop and his wife for tea three times and twice for dinner. The vestry had come for a light supper on at least four occasions, and once he had the courage to give a luncheon for the members of the altar guild, who had such a good time they didn't leave until four o'clock. Not that he was a great cook, of course. Still, he wasn't half bad at barbecued short ribs, an occasional sirloin tip roast that would melt in your mouth, if he did say so himself, and in the summer, silver queen corn, cooked in milk for precisely 60 seconds. Of course, there was always the economical rector's meatloaf, as he'd come to call it, which he usually made at least once a week. Once a week. He'd even been known to bake his own bread, but the interest these days somehow eluded him. Gardening had taken over. And where once he had sat and read cookbooks, he now read catalogues from Wayside Gardens and White Flower Farms, not to mention Jackson and Perkins. And another thing, he said to Barnabas, who raised one ear in response, is the cost. Do you realize what entertaining costs these days? Barnabas yawned. Lamb. I think it should be lamb, he mused to himself after going to bed and he didn't think it should take the form of anything nouvel. The thought came to him as he laid his head on the pillow. Company stew. It was an old recipe, nearly forgotten. 
but one that had always brought raves. Oots, oots, oots. He got out of bed and put on his faded burgundy dressing gown. Noting that the clock said 11, he slipped his feet into the chewed leather slippers and went downstairs to look for the recipe. The search revealed how vagrant his closets had become, so he began rearranging the one in the hall, which very likely his guests might see. When he finished, he was surprised to find that it was two o'clock in the morning, and he'd collected a box full of odds and ends for the Bane and Blessing sale. It was rather a free feeling, he noticed, prowling about the hall, prowling about the house at such an odd hour. To explore this strange freedom even further, he went into the kitchen, made himself a meatloaf sandwich with no mayonnaise, and sat at the table reading Bon Appetit, which he had bought for ideas and inspiration. No wonder I haven't done this sort of thing in years, he muttered. It's too demanding. He was feeling the way he'd felt when they asked him to be on the garden tour. Though the tour was to be of gardens only, he'd given the rectory a room-by-room -room inspection. It was as if he were seeing it for the first time. To his amazement, every ceiling corner seemed to have a spider web. There was clearly a ring in his bathtub, the shower tiles were mildewed, and the kitchen cabinets were in such a tangle of confusion it had taken a full half hour to locate his double boiler. At what point things had fallen into, the, into this state, he couldn't say, but fallen they had, and by the time of the tour, he was so exhausted from making both house and garden ready that he went to Medigate Farm for the entire weekend, inviting a retired priest from Wesley to con conduct Sunday services. Now he found himself compulsively cleaning out drawers his guests would never open, and closets they would never see, and polishing silver they would never use. But, he assured himself, it was a perfect time to get caught up. A dinner party provided the most excellent of excuses. You need help, house help, Emma had told him again and again. But then he was often told that he needed one thing or another. A cat, a bird, a gazebo, earmuffs, English garden tools, a word processor, a vacation, a bicycle, a wife, and until Barnabas, a dog. Several people had even made the unwelcome suggestion that he get himself a microwave. When he invited Emma on Monday morning, she was inspired at once to submit plans of her own. I'll bring the potato salad, she said happily, and make a batch of yeast rolls. No, 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 you won't bring a thing. This is a bona fide party where all, all you have to do is show up. Why not make it a covered dish? You don't need to do all that cooking by yourself. Marge could bring her chocolate cake they wrote up in the newspaper, and Hoppy Harper's house help could make something for him to bring. She was doing it again, treating him like a ten-year-old. Emma, no one is to bring anything, and that's final. It was indeed final, as she could plainly tell. He washed the slipcover on the sofa in his study, dusted books on the shelves that were low enough for anyone to reach, ordered four pounds of Avis Packard's valley-grown lamb, and two bottles of a ridiculously expensive Cabernet, asked Winnie Ivy to bake a special triple chocolate cake with raspberry filling, hung a new bird feeder outside the dining room windows, and pondered washing the study window that overlooked the best part of the garden. At this, however, he balked. As he might have guessed, everyone in the village seemed to know about the evening, which was now only a few days away. It amazed him that a man couldn't have a simple dinner party without attracting the attention of everybody, from the postal clerk to the dry cleaner. We hear you're having a big blowout, his barber said, while taking a little more off the side than they'd discussed. Were people looking at him as if they should have been invited? Couldn't a man have a few friends over without asking the whole blasted town? Though he still wanted to invite two others, he couldn't decide who they should be. In the meantime, he had ordered for eight and was preparing for eight and was relieved that everybody not only could come but seemed pleased at the prospect. He'd also given some thought to Barnabas. Perhaps he would allow his friend into the study after dinner, which meant, of course, that Barnabas would need a bath. At the office one morning, it occurred to him that instead of bathing Barnabas in the guest room shower stall, he would stop by the hardware store and buy a large tin tub. That way he could begin the practice of bathing him in the garden and avoid the cleanup in the bathroom. After a quick lunch with Harry Nelson, who reported that the origin of the painting still hadn't been verified, he went to the hardware store. One of his favorite smells was that of an old hardware store. In fact, it was right up there with the smell of wood smoke, leather-bound books, and leaf mold after a rain. More than that, it unfailingly brought back a rush of memories from his Mississippi boyhood. 
As a 4-H rabbit grower for two years, he had often traded at the local hardware for hutch materials and feed. He could even remember the time he picked out six yellow goslings from a box kept warm by a light bulb. He decided on a tin tub for twenty-two ninety-five, and took it to Dora Pugh at the cash register. You want to drive around for this, Father? No, Dora, this is cash and carry. I see you walk here by here every day, and I still forget you don't drive a car. How in the nation do you make out? Not too bad, actually. Nearly everything I could want, and some things I don't, are all right here in these two town blocks. I guess you're going to tote this tub on your head, like in the movies. He gave her cash to the penny. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do it till I get started. He tried to hold the tub under his arm, but that didn't seem to work, so he took it by one of the handles and was disappointed to note that the rim of it banged against his ankle as he walked to the door. Turning to say goodbye, he saw that Dora had ducked down behind the pocket knife display case, shaking with laughter. Dora, I see you back there laughing. You'd better quit that and show some respect to the clergy. He waved cheerfully and stepped out onto the sidewalk pleased with both his idea and his purchase. He just hoped that people did not think him eccentric. He would far rather be thought ingenious or practical. By the time he turned the corner of the bank and headed home, he was willing to admit that a car provided something more valuable than convenience. It provided privacy. Otherwise, he reasoned, everyone passing by could stare into your business, which one and all seemed to be doing. He hurried the last half block for the rectory, set the tub down in a clearing amid some laurel, and unwound the garden hose to make certain it would reach. Perfect, he exclaimed, warming to his task on Friday. On Friday, he left the office early, stopped by the local, and went home to change into an old T-shirt and khaki pants. He would get the bath out of the way straight off, he thought, then begin the stew around three, open the wine to breathe at six, and have everything in good order for his guests at seven. When he opened the door to the garage, Barnabas leapt into the hallway, skidded nearly the length of it on a small oriental rug, then dashed into the kitchen and hurled himself onto the bar stool, where he began to lick a final placemat on the counter. The rector put Barnabas on his longish leash. Not only would this give him freedom to thrash about in the tub, it would keep him from bounding into the street if the new setup alarmed him. Unfortunately, this would prove to be the worst idea he'd had in a very long time. He was pleased with his location of the tub, the little clearing was shielded from the street by the laurels and afforded him plenty of elbow room. As soon as Barnabas was bathed, he thought, he'd rub him down with a towel and then lead him into the garage, where he could finish drying off and make himself presentable. Attaching the looped end of the leash to a laurel branch high over his head, he encouraged Barnabas to get into the water, which he'd liberally sudsed with joy. Instead, Barnabas hurled himself into the tub with a mighty leap. Just as quickly as he went in, he came out, diving between the rector's legs. He circled his right leg and plunged back into the water, soaking his master from head to foot. Then he leapt out of the tub, raced again between Father Tim's legs, joyfully dashed around his left ankle, and headed for a laurel bush. It seemed to the rector that it all happened within a matter of seconds, and while his memory searched wildly for a scripture, nothing came forth. Barnabas circled the bush at a dead heat, catching the leash in the crotch of a lower limb, and was brought to an abrupt halt. The taut the taut, tightly drawn leash had run out. Barnabas was trapped on the bush, and each of the rector's ankles was tightly bound. Shaken, Father Tim observed this set of circumstances from a sitting position, and in the most complete state of shock he could remember. Miraculously, he was still wearing his glasses. Barnabas was now lying down, though the leash was caught so tightly in the tree that he could not lower his head. He stared at Father Tim, obviously suffering the misery of remorse. Then, his contrition being so deep that he could not bear to look his master in the eye, he appeared to fall into a deep sleep. The rector began spontaneously to preach one of the most electrifying sermons of his career. His deep memory bank of holy scripture came flooding back, and the power of his impassioned exhortation made the hair fairly bristle on the black dog's neck. In fact, Barnabas opened his eyes and listened intently to every word. When his oration ended... The rector felt sufficiently relieved to try and figure out what to do now. He could see it now, his guests ringing the doorbell, finally coming inside, searching the house, calling out the back door, and then spying him in this miserable condition, while the stew pot sat cold on the stove. No wonder so many people these days had heart fibrillations, high blood pressure, and a thousand other stress-related diseases. No doubt all of these people were dog owners. 
Lord, be thou my helper, he prayed. Father Tim, is that you back there? Avis Packard came crashing through the laurel hedge, looked down at his good customer and said without blinking, I'll let you get away without your butter. Do you want me to put it in the refrigerator or just leave it right here? Fortunately, the wash tub incident had put him only an hour off schedule. The stew was on and simmering, and the fragrance in the rectory was intoxicating. The old walnut dining table gleamed under the chandelier and cast a soft glow over a silver bowl of yellow roses tinged with crimson. The Cabernet sparkled in clear cut in cut glass decanters. The strains of a Mozart sonata filled the room with an air of expectancy, and in the fading afternoon light, the gardens looked fresh and inviting from every window. He felt rather fresh and inviting himself, having shaved and showered. Also, he was wearing his new sports coat. He hadn't come up with two more guests who would perfectly fit in, but he saw this as an advantage. Tonight's little gathering would be relaxed and intimate, like family, and all would get a chance to know each other better. At 6.45, the bell rang, and while the invitation was for seven o'clock, he was ready and waiting. He opened the door to see Miss Rose and Uncle Billy, standing on the porch holding hands and dressed in their best finery. Preacher, said Uncle Billy, grinning broadly, we didn't know if you was ever going to visit us, so we come to visit you. Emma arrived at seven sharp, parking her lilac Oldsmobile in directory drive. Hoppy Harper's old Volvo station wagon pulled in behind her. Emma glanced furtively in the rearview mirror to see whether she was wearing enough eye shadow as Hoppy walked up to open her door. She thought he looked surprisingly boyish in a cotton sweater and khakis. When Father Tim greeted them on the porch stoop, Emma was so delighted to see her rector in a new jacket that she gave him a big hug and an air kiss that sounded something like, Mwa! And then she walked into the living room. There, seated on the antique Chippendale sofa, were Miss Rose and Uncle Billy Watson, sipping a glass of sherry. Miss Rose was wearing Lyle stockings, rolled below her knees, a pair of unlaced saddle Oxfords, three World War II decorations on the front of her dress, a great deal of rouge, and a cocktail hat with a veil. Uncle Billy had on a suit that had belonged to his brother-in-law, with a vest and a gold watch chain. A broad grin revealed his gold tooth, which coordinated handsomely. Emma, Hoppy, have a chair, said their host, as serene as a cherub. And will you have a glass of sherry? Make it a double, said the astounded Emma. Miss Sadie arrived with Helen Marge, who had fetched her down from Fernbank. She carried a small shopping bag that contained several items for her rector's freezer, two Swanson chicken pies, one package of Sara Lee fruit turnovers, and a box of Eggos. This was what Miss Sadie considered a proper hostess gift when the Baxter apples were not in season. Marge was busy hugging one and all, including Miss Rose, who did not relish a hug. Hal was talking with Hoppy and Uncle Billy about baseball, and Miss Sadie was chattering with Emma. Why, it's a real celebration already, the rector thought happily, seeing two golden finches dart toward the feeder. Miss Sadie, your apple trees have been the prettiest I've ever seen, Marge said, taking a glass of mineral water from her host. Do you know, car loads of people have driven by the orchards this year. They've been a regular tourist attraction, and somebody from over at Westley stopped to ask if they could get married under the trees that back up to Church Hill. What did you say? I said, when do you think it might be? And she said she didn't know. He hadn't asked her yet. The host brought in a tray of cheese and crackers. He refused to serve anything that had to be dipped. He thought dipping at parties was perilous, to say the least. If you didn't drip dip on yourself, you were likely to drip it on someone else. He would once had a long conversation with his new bishop, only to look downward afterwards, down afterwards, and discovered that his shirt front displayed a regular assortment of the stuff, including bacon and onion. That he did not serve dip seemed especially convenient for Miss Rose, who took two of, every, two of everything offered, eating one and putting the other in her dress pocket. Uncle Billy, on the other hand, took two of everything and ate both at once. As he passed around the mushrooms in puff pastry, Miss Sadie was admiring Miss Rose's military decorations. He had to admit that he'd never given a party quite like this. The company stew, which had simmered with the peel of an orange and a red onion stuck with cloves, was a rousing success. In fact, he was so delighted with the whole affair that he relented and let Barnabas into the study after dinner. Marge ser helped serve coffee and triple-layer cake from the old high boy as the scent of roses drifted through the open windows. Barnabas, meanwhile, was a model of decorum 
and lay next to his master's wing chair, occasionally wagging his tail. You must have quoted this dog the whole book of Deuteronomy, said Emma, who still refused to call him by name. This dog, he said crisply, is grounded. Uh-oh, said Hal. I guess that means no TV for a week. No TV, no pizza, no talking on the phone. Ogre, said Marge. What did the big guy do, anyway? Hoppy wondered, leaning over to scratch Barnabas behind the ears. I'm afraid it's unspeakable, actually. Oh, good, exclaimed Miss Sadie. Then tell us everything. Miss Sadie enjoyed the bath story so much, she brought out a lace handkerchief to wipe her eyes. Miss Rose, however, was not amused. I leave dogs alone. Nope, dogs leave you alone, said her husband. Whatever, said Miss Rose with a wave of her hand. Hoppy set his dessert plate on the hearth, then leaned back and stretched his long legs. He looked fondly at his elderly patient of nearly a decade. Uncle Billy, I'd sure like to hear a joke if you've got one. Uncle Billy grinned. Did you hear the one about the skydiving lessons? I hope you didn't get this from Harry Nelson, said Emma, who didn't like Harry Nelson jokes, not even secondhand. No, sir. I got this feller off I got this off a feller at the grill. He was driving through from Texas. Everyone settled back happily, and Miss Rose gave Uncle Billy the go-ahead by jabbing him in the side with her elbow. Well, this feller, he wanted to learn to skydive, don't you know? And so he goes to this school and he takes all kinds of training and all. And one day comes the time he has to jump out of this airplane. And out he goes like a ton of bricks. And he gets on down there a little ways and commences to pull the cord. And they don't nothing happen, don't you know? So he keeps on dropping and he switches over and starts pulling on his emergency cord. And they still don't nothing happen. And the first thing you know, here comes this other feller a shooting up from the ground. And the feller going down says... Hey, buddy, do you know anything about parachutes? And the other one coming up says, Nope. Do you know anything about gas stoves? Uncle Billy looked around proudly. He would have considered it an understatement to say that everyone roared with laughter. I've heard that blooming tale 40 times, Miss Rose said, removing a slice of cheese from her pocket and having it with her coffee. Miss Sadie followed her, ter followed her host into the kitchen. I'm just having the best time in the world, father. You and me both, he said, measuring out some more coffee beans. I want to have you up to lunch soon. There's something I'd like to talk with you about that's been on my mind for a long while. It was rare indeed for Miss Sadie to have anyone up to Fernbank for anything these days. It's not another fine from your attic, is it? Oh my, no. It's much more important than that. I'll look forward to it, he said, putting his arm around her frail shoulders. You know, we're supposed to hear something about that. Hmm. We're supposed to hear something about our painting next week. Yes, I know. And I hope you wouldn't think this is awful of me. What's that? I dearly hope it's not a Vermeer. He knew precisely what she meant. Although he'd never said it to a soul, that was his hope as well. That was Papa's painting. I remember when he brought it home and we hung it on the wall downstairs. We all stepped back and just stared for hours. It was a real painting from Europe. I dearly loved to see it on the wall in Lord's Chapel. And so would I, he said kindly. As she went back to the study, Hal joined him, and the two men walked out to the back stoop. The air was balmy and sweet with springtime. Fine dinner, Tim. Thanks. It's great to be back in circulation. Diabetes seems to be doing you more good than harm, Hal sat on the railing and tamped the tobacco in his pipe. About that job on the vestry, he said. Let me put it this way. 170 acres, a full-time practice, Five dogs, two horses, 15 cows, an old farmhouse that needs a lot of work, and an increasingly pregnant 50-year-old wife. Enough said. The timing isn't right, and those trips into town at night, you know I want to serve, I want to do something more. Just remember, remember that I have in the past, and I will in the future. Father Tim nodded. When you can, Hal. You know I'd like you to be our senior warden. Hal puffed on his pipe and nodded thoughtfully. They heard a dog bark in the distance and a train whistle. You know that pony that got, that got caught in the fence? We put a saddle on him today. Great news, that's been on my mind. As the coffee finished brewing, they went inside. You want a good man on the vestry, Hal said with a low chuckle. Recruit Uncle Billy. He'll loosen that crowd up. Father Tim poured fresh coffee into every cup. Miss Sadie, he said, 
I've been hoping you'd tell us tonight about your schooling in Paris. Oh, do you really want to hear that old stuff? Yes, said Marge, curling up on the sofa next to Hal. Even Barnabas assumed an air of expectancy, and Emma noticed that Hoppy Harper, who was sitting in Father Tim's wing chair, was as relaxed as a dish rag, she later said. I hardly know where to begin, it's been so long. But if you're sure... Well, everybody was absolutely sure. Well then, she said, sitting even more upright and squaring her shoulders, Paris, France was where I fell in love. Miss Sadie paused for a moment, her face beaming, and looked around the room. Father Tim saw at once that the truest meaning of the term captive audience was being demonstrated right before her eyes. She sat quiet for a moment, as if she had to summon the memory from a very long distance. I was 16 years old when Mama and Papa allowed me to study in Paris, she began. Oh, they didn't want me to, not a bit, but Uncle Haywood talked them into it, saying Mitford was just a jumping-off place, that I'd never learn anything worthwhile in Mitford. Wasn't that dreadful of him? So off I went with Mama, who was going to take me and spend a month or two near the academy before she came back home. I remember to this day what I was wearing when we left. It was a cream-coloured lawn with a, gorget, with a georgette bodice worked with seed pearls, and the waist was tied with satin ribbons. Oh, it was lovely. Papa took us down to Charleston to catch the boat. Mama and Papa and I cried the whole way. We just held on to each other and bawled, because my Papa was never afraid to shed a tear. He had the tenderest heart, and he was trying so hard to do what was right. And so we got on that old boat, and I had the worst sinking feeling. Why, we never even left the dock till we were so overcome with homesickness that we nearly threw ourselves overboard. Oh, law, said Uncle Billy, deeply moved. But there were such interesting people on that boat. My, what a collection. And they just took on over me, calling me sweet names and inviting us to eat at their table. So by the time I reached Paris, I had quit crying, and I just marched into that academy and started talking the worst old southern drawl French you ever heard. Why, they nearly fell down laughing at me. There was one other girl from home, from Virginia, and I stuck to her like bark on a tree. Mama had to live in this house nearby, and I could only see me on weekends and every Wednesday. She was so lonesome, and she could only say, wee oui, wee, oui, and she'd never spent a single night away from Papa. Well, I started learning to watercolor and recite poetry and play the pianoforte and do needlework and study ancient history, and I don't know what all. They just wanted to make me so fancy. And you know, all I dearly wanted to do was be plain. Can you imagine a girl with every privilege in the world just wanting to be plain? I knew it would be a disappointment to Papa and to Mama too. And the heck with Uncle Haywood. I wanted to be back in Mitford picking up walnuts and playing in my dollhouse at Fernbank and sewing doll clothes and helping China May in the kitchen and going barefooted under the apple trees with Luella. The very first Wednesday, Mom and I were glad to have our freedom, so glad to have our freedom, that we both just went skipping down the lane that led to the pastry shop. And while we were in there, Mama let me drink real coffee. Oh, it was the thickest, strongest, blackest stuff you could ever imagine. I just loved it. I thought if Paris, France was a taste instead of a city, this would be it. Miss Sadie's bright eyes appeared to be looking far away. Marge thought this was like opening an old book and reading a fairy tale with faded watercolour illustrations. While we were sitting there, we heard this voice and we looked up and there was this this handsome young American man buying a pastry and a cup of coffee. Listen to him talk, said Mama. Why, he sounds like he could be from Mitford. He was with another young man. Oh, they were so handsome and so young and carefree and they were laughing and it was just music to our ears. Mama never met a stranger in her life, though most people thought she was dignified. She just held out her pretty hand to him and said, Young man, where are you from? And he said, Midford, North Carolina, ma'am. United States of America. Miss Sadie's audience murmured with amazement. I'll never forget how proudly he said that. I'll never forget how proudly he said that, just like it was the best place on earth. Which, of course, it is, she said, beaming. Amen! Emma fairly thundered. He had just moved to Mid with Mitford with his family and baby sister from Tennessee, and he was in Paris to show some of his pharmaceutical invention inventions. Well, I could go on and on, but he invited Mama and me to have dinner with him that very evening, 
and he gave us his card and all, and Mama felt sure he was a gentleman. Every Wednesday after that, he met us for pastry and coffee and sent flowers to Mama and me to her rooms in the little pension. Miss Rose ate a piece of cubed ham and some Havarti from her pocket. Barnabas had gone to sleep, and the doctor, worn from months of unrelieved strain in his growing practice, snored quietly in the wing chair. One day I said, Mama, I don't know how to tell you this, but I just hate this place and everything about it. When I watercolour a dog, it looks exactly like an owl. I'm still playing three blind mice on the pianoforte, and my French is atrocious. I just want to go home and be plain Sadie. Do you know what my mama said? She said, oui, oui. When the young man learned we were leaving, he sent a dozen yellow roses to mama and a dozen red roses to me. There was a note attached to mine which said, some day when I have made my fortune, I would like to ask you to marry me. So we went home and Papa met us, and I never spoke another word of French in my life. And to this day, she paused and looked around, I've never forgotten that handsome young man from Mitford. Marge leaned forward. For heaven, for heaven's sake, Miss Sadie, who was he anyway? Miss Sadie looked straight at Miss Rose Watson, whose cocktail had it tipped forward at a rakish angle. That young man, Miss Sadie said, was Miss Rose's brother, Willard Porter. Hal, Marge, and Miss Sadie lingered after the, all the others had gone, eating Belgian chocolate. I've been very, very good all week in order to do this, Marge explained, looking only slightly sheepish as she took another piece off the tray. The rector had regained his... Uh, had regained his wing chair and put his feet up. Miss Sadie, in the years I've known you, you've always been a very private person. Why did you tell us that wonderful version of your Paris story tonight? Miss Sadie reflected on this. When I brought you that painting, it started something. I started thinking about things I'd never thought about before, and I decided, decided I was tired of holding on, holding on to my orchard, holding on to my possessions, holding on to my memories. I've decided, she said firmly, to start letting go. And that's one reason I'd like to see you next Thursday for lunch at noon, if you can come, Father. I'll be there with bells on. Swanson's chicken pie? My favourite, declared her weary but enthusiastic host. At one o'clock in the morning, having refused all offers of help, he put away the last dish and went upstairs, thankful that tomorrow was Saturday. He felt certain... <sighs> Pardon me. He felt certain there was more to Miss Sadie's story about Willard Porter, but he was even more certain of something else. Considering this party from beginning to end, from the initial idea to the last dried dish, it had occupied exactly six weeks of his life, and while he'd had a lovely evening, and so had everyone else, he was certain that he didn't want to do this again for a very long time. He picked up his open prayer book from the night table. The Lord grants his loving kindness in the daytime, he read from Psalm 42. In the night season, his song is with me. And we'll end it there for tonight. We'll carry on. I think maybe what we will do is do every two days. Um, because I'm, well, every second day generally, and then sometimes consecutive days. I think tomorrow probably we will, we will do a reading, but I have a number of engagements, so I might not be home in time. I will try to post on Instagram and Facebook whether or not that is happening. Uh, but either tomorrow, Saturday, or Sunday, we will continue with At Home in Mitford. Hopefully you're enjoying it. Stay safe, stay healthy. See you in a day or two.